It's so good to be here. Had a great time in the first service. So I love to be with my family here at International, whatever it is, Las Vegas. <laughs> International Church, is that what the, that it says? I love the Goulets, I love uh, the other staff members, and it's always a joy to be back here. Thank you for your uh, gifts, and thank you, those of you that join us on the post uh, every day. You do not miss a day, I know. Right? <laughs> and those of you that don't watch Give Him 15, we're going to have a time of repentance in just a few minutes. No, it's just good to be here. I'm going to encourage you today. I feel this message, uh, it, this, this word is, is going to bring a lot of hope and encouragement. My assignment typically is not to uh, bring messages that are primarily geared to an individual, but my assignment is to keep my focus on the nation where we are, what God's saying to America. And uh, so that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to share what I'm hearing and some dreams that uh, have been sent to me that are encouraging. Don't take your cue or your belief about what is happening or going to happen to this nation from the media. Don't take it from any political party. Don't take it from any secular group or organization. Listen to what God is saying. God is going to turn this nation back to him. We're going to be a part. Amen. We're going to be a part of the third great, awa it's third great awakening here. It'll be the first great awakening in some places. We're going to see the greatest revival that the earth has ever seen. We're going to see at least a billion souls saved over the next couple of decades. We're going to see nations, entire nations transformed. There will be Muslim nations today that won't be considered a Muslim nation 10 years from now. You know, when we pray and ask God to do these things, we're not trying to talk him into something. We're asking him be because he wants to. We ask according to his will. Then why do we ask? Well, I don't have time to teach on that, but he works on the earth through people, not in spite of or go around people. That's why Jesus had to be human to redeem us because... God doesn't work on the earth uh, apart from us. He works through us. That's the way he decided to do it, and he honors that decision. So, But when we pray and when we cry out for salvations and revival, we're not asking, we're not trying to talk God into or convince him to do something. We're just agreeing with him. We're just becoming his voice and releasing his kingdom into the earth. So he's coming to do this. He wants to do it more than you want him to do it. So, America shall be saved. Amen? I'm going to jump into this and, and share a couple of dreams that I'm sure some of you have heard, but my reason I'm going to do them quickly because of that because I know I've shared these on the post. Uh, I may have shared them here the last time I was here. I have no idea what I shared last time I was here. I don't write it down on purpose because I figure like, if God leads me to do it again, you probably need to hear it again. <laughs> I know I need to hear things more than once, so I don't do that. But uh, 
I'm going to share the first two, just sort of go through them quickly, uh, because I think, um, I just feel like I need to do that to, to give context for the third one, which I will read uh, fully, that I've been pondering for the last few days. And I feel like God gave me the in, some insight on it this morning. Uh, early as I was just reading and thinking and praying in my room. Uh, and uh, so I want to encourage you with that and then share one more piece of one more because uh, I'll be leaving here and going to New Jersey where tomorrow night I'll be doing a service based on an assignment that came through another dream. Uh, I'm keeping very busy these days. The first two dreams came from a lady named Gina Golston. She said she had a dream in 18, 018, that said America will be saved. And now she's probably had a dozen or 15 dreams over the last couple of years in which God says in one way or another, America shall be saved. I mean, he's just going overboard to encourage us and say, look, I'm going to do this. But in, the, in these two dreams, she dreams about uh, four places it, where in history God sent significant revivals. One of them is the Red River Meeting House in um, Tennessee. One of them is in Cane Ridge, uh, Kentucky. I think the Red River is actually across the, the river in Kentucky as well. One of them is Azusa Street and one of them is Wales. In this particular dream, it starts at the Red River Meeting House, and that's where really the first or the second Great Awakening began. America's had two Great Awakenings named the First Great Awakening and the Second Great Awakening. Both of those were such sweeping revivals that they impacted and transformed the nation. They weren't just pockets like Brownsville or Toronto. Some of you know about those or, you know, a church over here has a year or two of revival. That's not what these were. These were national revivals. Both of them literally saved this nation from destruction. Red River Meeting House, just a small place, and revival broke out in the uh, early 1800s, may have been 1800, may have been 1799, but right in that time frame. Then it spread to a place called Cane Ridge, Kentucky. And that became one of the most amazing revivals in all of history. Because without any means of advertising through media or technology, uh, no way to get there other than walking, riding horses or wagons. Still, tens of thousands of people came from hundreds of miles just from hearing uh, word of mouth reports about what was happening at Cane Ridge. And thousands were saved, delivered, healed. They would have numerous meetings going on at the same time because obviously they they have PA systems where they could speak to thousands. So there'd be a cluster of people over here, a few hundred and someone on a wagon standing to be seen, talking, preaching to them, maybe a quarter mile away. There's another group over here and somebody's standing on a tree stump using it as a pulpit and, and preaching and uh, literally would have people climb a tree and stand up in a tree so they could be heard. And this was happening all over the hills of this region. And history reports that, that at times bodies littered the ground of people. Just all over the hills you'd see bodies that were people out in the spirit and overcome by the power of God laying there being healed, 
delivered, filled with the Spirit. The glory of God was profound. And, and the Cane Ridge revival then led to the, the Second Great Awakening. So it was the Red River, then to Cane Ridge, and then uh, the Second Great Awakening. Of course, we all know what Azusa Street was. That was the great revival, Pentecost, baptism of the Holy Spirit in California in the early 1900s. And the Welsh revival was a great revival also in the 1900s that transformed the entire nation of Wales. So in this dream, Gina saw all these places and the Lord showed her through this dream that he was about to bring the strength, the anointing, the gifts and manifestations of his spirit that came in all of these, that he was about to bring them together into a synergistic multiplication of power and, and a revival that would be the greatest revival in history. Now, that's what we're moving into, the greatest revival in history. The earth has never seen anything like what's coming. At one point, I'm ahead of myself, but I'll go ahead and share it now because of what I just said. At one point, she was taken up into the heavens in this dream and looked to earth and saw Red River and Cane Ridge and a line connected them as she looked down the earth. And then a, a line went from each of those places over to California to Azusa Street. And together they formed the head of a spear. And then as she watched, a line went all the way to Wales. And it formed the shaft. And God said, I'm going to take all that I did in these, re these revivals. And they're going to become my weapon today as I release another great outpouring in the earth. But in the dream, the, the first of the two, she saw, as she pulled onto the property at Red River, she saw a hundred eagles. And she thought that was fascinating. They each had three arrows and a scroll. And then she pulled a little farther in. A truck pulled up with a r drilling rig, began to dig, and a geyser erupted. And a voice spoke from heaven telling her that the, the revival river of the Red River Meeting House is, is about to erupt again. In fact, the voice said, this is set on the timing of heaven. Do not think that Satan is controlling the timing of what's happening in the earth right now. Do not think that. Because in, and in his dream, he said, this is set on the timing of heaven. And then, the, and then the voice from heaven spoke and said, it's time. So the eagles, then a, a, a clapping came from, the, from heaven, and the eagles knew that it was a, a, it was a signal for them, and they uh, began to fly, and they went through the geyser until they were all drenched. And then they begin to fly to different parts of the nation. And one of the fascinating things in this dream, they never dried. Everywhere they went, they were still soaking wet, and the water flew off of them everywhere they went. And people were drenched with the water of revival from Red River Meeting House. Then the, the scene changed, and she went inside, and there were apostolic leaders drawing up plans sitting at architect tables and people would come in they would get in the water and become drenched they'd come inside they'd give be given an assignment and they would go and be translated to where uh, god wanted them to accomplish the assignment another one come in there were seven of them and they just kept in seconds they'd have another assignment ready and pass it out to the next person and then another one to the next person and the sign above them said rapid response team I'm going to have to hurry because I'm getting distracted by all the good stuff in these dreams. But I will say this. We're coming into a season 
where our busyness will not be from frivol frivolous things. But those of us that are committed to the cause of Christ, we're going to have all we can keep up with just dealing with this great harvest that's coming. She was given another dream several months later. And in this dream, one of the leaders from the Hebrides revival came to her. She did not know at the beginning of the dream who it was. But she was standing next to him and she could feel a strong anointing that was bringing great hope to her. And as the two of them in the dream were caught up into hev heaven, they were looking down to earth, specifically at America. And they began to see what looked like war planes flying over America. And the man looked at her and said, Oh my. Look at all those war planes. I wonder what all these war planes are doing over America. And she looked at him and said, Those aren't war planes. Those are eagles. I've seen them before in another dream. These dreams are crazy wild, aren't they? These people are getting a series of dreams now. She said, I've seen them before in another dream. They're eagles from the Red River Meeting House, and they're drenched with the water of revival, and they're sprinkling it all over America. And he said to her, you have seen well. At one point in the dream then, they watched the eagles fly. They were all over the nation, all corners of it, a hundred of them, each with three arrows. And as if on cue, at the same time, they swooped to the earth and all of them released their three arrows. So a hundred or 300 arrows were released into America, covering the entire nation all at the same time. And fires of revival sprang up all over our nation. And I'm going to read you what the man said to her then. You have seen correctly. This is how America shall be saved. Then he said to her, do not doubt it. There is coming a sweeping move of the Spirit of God that will ignite America with the fire of his presence. This will bring a swift, undeniable awareness of God and an awakening. What seems to be one thing, they look like warplanes, but they were eagles. What seems to be one thing is about to be revealed as another. Some are in fear because of how things appear, but others see with holy awe and expectation. I said this already. Do not take your belief about what is coming to this nation from the secular media, any political group. Take your cue and your belief from what Holy Spirit is saying. He is coming with great power to this nation. He continued and said, the eagles are on assignment. They carry firepower. They carry glory. And at the precise moment, their arrows will be released. 
hit the targets and the move of God will ignite and spread very quickly. And then he said to her again, do not doubt it. Now, just this past week, another dream was sent to me. And I've been pondering this dream for several days. Some of it, the meaning is obvious, which you'll see as I read it. Phrase about America's inheritance coming. A phrase about the fullness of time. Those things are fairly obvious. But there's another part of the dream that's been just sort of nagging at me. What is, why did he do this? Why did he say this? What is it all about? I believe the Lord gave me that understanding this morning. So let me read that dream to you. It's a different person. I dreamed the morning of November 4th that the Lord told me to tell Dutch Sheets that he, God, was about to bring the nation into an early inheritance. I'm not sure what that early inheritance thing is. There's a part of me that... Let me just digress for a second. I don't know if I've ever said this publicly, but I believe sometimes the prayers of the church determine the timing of the Lord. I believe we literally speed up some things God is, is doing, and I believe we can slow things down when we're not praying. It's almost as though I feel in, the, in this dream God is saying to me, if you will keep praying, if the various streams and ministries that are promoting prayer, if, if, if all of you keep doing what you're doing, I know, and I'm blown away by this, but we average two to 250,000 people a day on all the platforms together that are praying with me on Giving 15. And I know, listen, I know I'm one of several ministries that are leading prayer efforts. I'm going to be asking the Lord about this, but it's almost as though I feel He's saying, this is coming more quickly now. But he said, tell Dutch that he, he's about to bring the nation into an early inheritance. The dream shifted immediately to Dutch and I standing in front of an arcade machine. Had a toy bulldozer inside surrounded by Morgan silver dollars and the machine would move forward this way and this way and um, just to summarize you know the, the idea was you put a coin in you put a silver dollar in I guess you'd go to the window and get them I don't know how this works but you'd get them and, and, and you had to you had to drop it at just the right time in the exact right place when the dozer was in the right place. And if you've hit it to the millisecond just right, you got the, you got the coins, the, the, all the Morgan silver dollars. So the machine would move the dozer forward, backward, occasional coin. Dutch spoke and said the nation's inheritance would begin right there. 
He said that if he had another Morgan Silver dollar, he could initiate a tipping point for a release of the nation's early inheritance. I told him I had one in my pocket that my grandfather had given me, and I always carry it. He said, I refused to take it and said, I can't take the coin your grandfather gave you. He said, if you believe the tipping point can begin here, then you have to use this coin. Dutch took the Morgan silver dollar cautiously and sought God on when and where to drop place and position the dollar. He waited for the dozer to reach its furthest back position. In the millisecond of time, the dozer stood still. He dropped the dollar. The Morgan silver dollar fell perfectly, placed perfectly, and performed perfectly. The toy dozer began to shove every Morgan dollar into the chute, and they slid into my possession. I started looking for his coin to give back to him. The third coin I picked up, he said, had a slim piece of paper attached. It almost looked like what would be found on a fortune cookie or in a fortune cookie. The paper said, welcome to the fullness of time. Fullness of time is when you begin to reap. It's the time that you've been moving toward in order to get your harvest or your breakthrough. You've got chronos, general time, kairos, opportune time, horeos, the right time, plerao, fullness of time. Jesus came at the fullness of time. Everything is happening now. Pentecost came at the fullness of time. Fullness of time is when everything you've been praying about begins to take place. I'm, that's clear to me because I know we're moving into this revival. I've stopped saying it's coming and I say it's here. Sometimes I say it's here and it's coming because we're not in the full, we're not in the, in the uh, mature stage of it, but we are in the beginning stage. I believe I understand what the nation's inheritance is. It's our destiny in God to be his voice of the gospel to the ends of the earth. I understand some of this dream, but I've been asking the Lord, why, why did you use Morgan silver dollars in this dream? So this morning I was up early praying and just saying, Lord, talk to me, show me what this is. And I started just researching Morgan silver dollars. Kept thinking, maybe there's something about them that's a hidden message here on the back I finally uh, saw found pictures of them and on the back of the of the coin is an eagle and the eagle has three arrows in its talons Would God give a dream about silver dollars to a person to confirm another dream to me that it's time for the arrows of revival to be released into the earth? Would he do that? Would he, would he give those dreams and then give another one that says fullness of time and show on a coin an eagle with those three arrows just to say to me and confirm to me, it is time. You need to be telling people, it's time. This is coming now. 
I mean, you get to be pretty cynical to believe that that's not what he's saying. We are moving into a season that will represent the greatest revival and outpouring of Holy Spirit this planet has ever seen. Entire cities are going to turn to Jesus. Entire nations are going to turn to Jesus. Entire groups of people, age groups and, and the tribes are going to come to Jesus. Did you know that the, do you know where more people are being saved today than any place else in the world? Iran, Iran. Do you know what number two is? Afghanistan. And most, and some, some say the estimates are as high as 28,000 Muslims around the world are coming to Christ every day. Every day. And the miracles, creative miracles are taking place. And God through angels are being sent to people in dreams and visions. Jesus himself is coming to people in visions. One man who works in that part of the world said to us, most, many, not most, many of the people that hear a message of the gospel for the first time and someone explains to them who Jesus is, they call him Isa. They, they know of Jesus. They just don't know the gospel. And, and have understanding of it. They just believe he's a prophet. But when it's explained to them, many of those people say, oh, I know who he is. He comes to me often in my dreams. Well, I'll tell you something. Not only is he doing that in Afghanistan, and I ran. Now I'm, on, now I'm going to talk Texan to you. He's fixing to do it in America too. Because I tell you, high school kids are going to start congregating around the lockers. And one of them is going to dare. They're just going to have the nerve to speak up and say, you know, I had a dream about Jesus last night. And someone else is going to say, well, you know, I did too. Because God's going to start doing things supernaturally to jumpstart this outpouring and this revival. Because these arrows are now being dropped all over the nation. And the fires of revival are about to spring up. And the Lord says, do not doubt this. Do not doubt this. I tell you, creative miracles are coming. Incredible deliverances are coming. I see the good thing about it, the, the, the wonderful thing about a true miracle, I mean a true miracle. My friend was born blind. I know him. I go to school with him. And now he sees. Somebody prayed for him in Jesus' name. He has eyeballs where he didn't have one. That's a miracle. I'm talking miracles. Not somebody gets healed of a headache. That's great. But I'm talking about a, an undeniable miracle. What they're going to do is they're going to unravel 20, 30, 40 years of humanistic, secularistic, atheistic teaching, training, discipling of a generation. And people that don't believe in God, don't believe in the Bible, don't believe in Jesus, or, or maybe they just believe that he exists, don't know anything about him, and that's, there are decades of training and teaching and, and
brainwashing. It's going to be unraveled in 30 seconds. It's going to be like the guy that Jesus healed that was born blind. And all the theologians are talking about, you know, the miracle and can it happen and he's not supposed to do this and he didn't do this right, he didn't do that right. And, 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 and you know, trying to trip the guy up and his explanation was real simple. You guys can, he said, you guys can talk the theology. That's, that's, that's a, you go ahead and you, you know, that's not me. That's not my place. Uh, I don't know the theological stuff. Here's, all, here's what I know. I was blind, now I see. It's a game changer. It's a game changer. And it's coming. And I'm going to say this and I'll move on to one, one final point. You're gonna, we're going to see more miracles out there, outside the walls of the church, than we see in the church. Not that people won't be healed in our gatherings. Not that God doesn't want to do it there. He said he's not going to be confined to a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night. He's not going to be confined to these meetings. And most of those people, until they see something like that, they're not going to come to these meetings. So he's going to go out there and do it. Now I'm going to shift gears and, and in the next five to ten minutes, say one more thing. As a beginning stage of this, he is coming to encourage and refire the church, especially, especially leaders many of whom are weary. What's the word I'm looking for? Some just need a fresh encounter with the Lord. I don't care who you are, you go through seasons where life happens and you don't have to be a bad person or someone that's living in sin or that doesn't love the Lord anymore for him to come to you and say I need you to return to first love you don't have has that ever happened to me absolutely it's happened to me so God is coming to the church to visit us in ways that won't be, don't expect it to come through hellfire and brimstone messages saying, you bunch of, you bunch of sorry, lukewarm people, uh, turn or burn, you know. That's not, that's not what's coming. What's coming is Abba. Daddy. Jesus, our friend, our savior, our lover, that what's coming is he is coming to embrace his people and say, look, we're about to see something incredible. I need you. We're going to work together. Before that happens, I'm just going to, I'm going to revitalize. I'm going to refresh. I'm going to break off of you the stuff that's gotten you know, dumped on you over this last season. I'm going to baptize you afresh and new in my Holy Ghost and fire, and you're going to become my arrow that I drop on this part of the country. And one of my friends, and one another one of these prophetic friends that sends me dreams, he said three dreams in the last two or three months about God reopening wells of revival. And one of those wells is a place 
uh, where a man min- uh, named Tennant, T-E-N-N-E-N-T, ministered. Tennant was one of the uh, men God used in the first Great Awakening, in the mid and earlier, uh, first half, let's say, of the 1700s. He was a contemporary of Whitfield, and Jonathan Edwards. But Tennant's burden and the message God used him to preach and trumpet was toward the clergy. And he said to them, you need a fresh baptism of fire. He said to some of them, you're not even saved. And it was true in that day. Some of them were just professionals. Well, we have it today too. But for others, it wasn't that they weren't saved. It was that they needed a fresh baptism of fire. And one of these dreams, this is on one of my posts. In the dream, the, the well erupted again with fire shooting into the sky. And he saw people coming by the thousands with pieces of wood and they, they held the wood to the fire until it was burning and then they ran home uh, and, began to, and started fires representing revival where they had come from. But in the dream, he knew that the piece of wood they brought was from their pulpits that they had busted up before they came and they brought a piece of it to the tenant well of revival until it caught fire and they went back to their homes, home churches with pulpits ablaze. And the fires of revival spring up there. He just had another dream about this same well, a dream that I never share, I haven't shared. I'm going to be sharing it in the next two or three days on the post. But this one is about, I, I, he and I went to a place in this dream to re-enlist people into what God was about to do because they were, they had become in their minds and the minds of many in the church disqualified because of failures and things that had happened. And we found them in a bar. But the name of the bar in the dream, <laughs> when the Lord does this stuff, it's just like, it was called Tenants Tavern and Well. And they were there just doing nothing. And he and I showed up. You'll love this dream when you can hear the whole thing. Because we were desperate for more workers. And we came in and I said, hey, give me your attention in here. I'm here to enlist you for the excavating of a river and the third great awakening. And one of them said, Our cups are dry and we're forsaken. We can't help you. And I stepped back and began to prophesy. I release the fire and the, and the, and the wine of the spirit to fill those cups in front of you. Drink it and meet me outside. You can't make that stuff up. They drank that new wine and came outside transformed and said, we're ready to go to work. I'm leaving here today and I'm going to New Jersey, which was already planned. And then the guy who had the dream called me, had the dreams about tenant. He didn't know who Tenet was when he had the dreams. I didn't either. But the guy who had the dreams called me and said, you know where we're going to be is only 20 minutes from where Tenet ministered. Maybe you should come a day early and we should go there and just drink from that well. 
maybe even do a service where we prophesy and decree to the nation that the fire of God is coming to the church, to fallen leaders, to those that are tired and weary, that God's about to pour out his spirit on us so he can use us to do it out there. Come on. So that's what I'm going to do tomorrow night. <clears throat> listen. Just go outside and listen. You might hear me prophesying over Las Vegas tomorrow night. I'm going to finish with this. I'm going to pray. I believe in accountability. I believe that leaders are supposed to be held to a high standard. But I do not like a theology that says if a leader falls or fails, God can never use them again. I don't like that. Some people, Christians, believe that God can do for an unbeliever what he can't do for one of his own kids. And that is to cleanse them with the blood of Jesus to the point that he doesn't even remember it anymore. It's almost like we think the person that comes and gets saved, he separates their sins from them as far as the east is from the west and doesn't remember it anymore. But what if one of his own kids comes and needs to repent and get cleaned up that God says, well, I can't forgive you to that level. Well, I don't believe it. And while I do believe that we must... walk and live in integrity and righteousness and have accountability. I do believe that. But I'm telling you, God is coming to a lot of people that feel like they're disqualified and he's going to baptize them fresh, new, and Holy Spirit. And you're going to see them start preaching. God's going to use them to work signs and wonders. I tell you, there are prophets right now that are still living under bridges. There's some evangelists of the future that are shooting up today. But what God's about to do is glorious enough that they're going to be transformed, delivered, set free, and some of them are going to be able to be used by him fairly quickly. Some of them are already cleaned up. They just live under so much condemnation, they don't think God could ever use them again. Well, I'm one minute over, so I've got to stop right now. Okay, you're going to give me two or three minutes to pray, right? I'm just going to pray. Y'all stand, I want to pray over you. You know what I'm going to do? I feel like I just want to ask for that tenant fire to come here to, to Vegas, to this house, to those connected to this house, to the leaders of this house. He knows what you need. Some of you just need encouragement. You're just tired. Some of you have family situations that have been dragging you down. You just need Holy Spirit to come and infuse you with hope, faith, strength. Some of you need physical healing. The last season, you got sick or something has come on you and you need a miracle. Listen, he, God can just do it today. He can start something here today. The eagles are flying. We've come to a fullness of time. And you can drink from this well today. Lord, thank you for your great love. You're such a good dad. 
I thank you, Jesus, for your great love. And Father, I thank you for loving the world so much that you sent Jesus to become one of us and do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. Be the sacrifice for sin to be restored to you. And I feel now your great love, your passion for those who don't know you, who are lost, who are some in despair, some just in rebellion. They don't even know enough to know they're in rebellion. They just are in another world from you. But you're coming. You're coming. And you're coming to save. They're condemned already. You're not coming to condemn them. You said you, you're coming to forgive and cleanse. And so we thank you for this. And you said don't doubt it. We don't doubt it. This awakening is coming. You're wrapping up every revival in history. And you're bringing them all together in one synergistic outpouring where power and strength and all that you're about is multiplied. It goes all over the earth. You're going to rescue and save and deliver and transform. America's going to get in on it, Canada, Mexico, South America, Asia, Europe, Australia, South America, the islands of the sea. You're coming with this outpouring of your spirit. Nothing is going to stop it. And so it's time. And we've come to a fullness of time. So bring the inheritance early. Bring it now, Lord. Turn the switch and come to this house, come to this city, and begin to rain down the fire from tenants' revival, a fresh outpouring of Holy Spirit, fire and anointing and passion. Passion, strength, renewed vision and vitality. Break every assignment off of anyone associated with this place. Everything God has promised this house will be established and fulfilled. Not any of it will be lost. In your future, your biggest problem will be, what do we do with this harvest? It's so big. Lord, we just ask you for that. I'm just dare to and bold enough to say whatever we open or you use us to do tomorrow night, just let it arc from New Jersey all the way to Nevada. Let it go to California. Let it go up to Washington. Let it go from the east all the way to the west. Let the miracles begin here, Lord. Every time I come here, I feel a miracle anointing. I don't know how many they're seeing, but I ask you to flip the switch now and let the power for miracles begin to flood into this house. Gifts of healing. Extraordinary miracles, angelic activity at a high level, I don't know, Lord, just 
show me of it. If it's over this city or this house, maybe both, I just can hear the heavens breaking. There's a fracturing that's taking place. There's, there's an opening that's being created, a portal. Lord, we step into that opening now. We say you are rending the heavens, coming down. And that which has been created over this city, this state, this region, through strongholds of darkness, you are coming to, to deal with that because we've asked you to. You want to. And you're going to break through all of that and Lord you're going to begin to open the eyes of people that don't understand who you are you're going to begin to bring revelation of who Jesus is you're going to bring an outpouring of your goodness your grace your power your anointing into this house into this region we release it today over this place Rapid response teams going from here to the city, to the state, to the nation and nations. Apostolic sending, a multiplication of gifts and anointings going from here to the nations. I just want to announce over this house, it's a new day. It's a new season. You're moving into it, you're in it, you're moving fully in it. Don't even, don't even think about some of the past. It's time to move into a fresh outpouring of the Spirit. I know I'm not doing, saying this because I think things are messed up here. I'm just saying you've broken through. You're broken through. It's a fresh outpouring that's coming to this place. Streams in the desert, roads in the wilderness. That's what I hear over this. Now, Lord, let, let this begin today. Right now. Let people be touched and transformed, spirit, soul, body, today. Born again today. Fill with your spirit today. Heal today. Heal emotionally today. Begin this now in this place. from Numbers 23 when the prophet was asked to curse Israel and he told the king there's no curse I can't do it I don't see a curse I only see blessing. I say that which the enemy has tried to do to curse the work of God in this region, to curse this work, to stop it, to, to hinder, to interrupt. You have no idea if you're not on a leadership of a ministry like this, the warfare that exists. 
the enemy's just always trying to do something to distract and, and stop it. But I just say no curse will stand and no curse will succeed. Only blessing is over this place. Only life is over this place. Only blessing is over this place. So that's what I release. And the shout of the king is among you. That's what the prophet said. I hear the shout of the king among them. Come on, let's just do that right now. I want the shout of the king. Come on, lift up a shout. We are warriors. 